Debating Death and Memory, Past and Present. It's an Archaeodeath debate. Hello Archaeodeathlings and welcome to another video, this time exploring the mysteries of the Smiling Abbot. Who is the Smiling Abbot, you might say? Where does he come from? What date does he date from? Why is he smiling? And why is he an abbot? And why should anyone care? Well, hopefully this video will give you a, a sense because I'm going to take you on a journey into the later Middle Ages and the world of monastic mortuary archaeology and specifically of Welsh mortuary monastic archaeology um, because the last time there's been a systematic survey of later medieval mortuary monuments was uh, Colin Gresham. His funerary archaeology study of the stone, uh, medieval stone carvings in North Wales. And since then, there's only been a few articles, a few bits and bobs have come out. And I uh, had the chance in 2017 to encounter a newly rediscovered fragment of an effigial slab. And I did some work with the Thlangothlan Museum, who had it on temporary loan, um, and with Aaron Watson, the archaeologist, artist and photographer, to publish this find and explore its character. So come with me on an archaeodeath journey back to the 14th century. Here it is. Here's the smiling abbot. Now this was uh, encountered at Langotham Museum when I went with some colleagues in um, 2017 and I said I, I haven't seen anything quite like it and uh, so that's how the project got started. Let me give you a quick introduction to it. So here's two lit versions by uh, Dr. Aaron Watson, two still images taken from different lighting, showing you the gravestone. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively small slab, but we've got two sides preserved originally. They damaged along the top and this side, and it would originally have had another side coming down here and a whole bottom. It would have been a full grave slab for covering a grave. And it's long been out of context. Um, now, at first, I didn't realise uh, what I was looking at. I thought well, it looks familiar. I recognised the, 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 the style of lettering. I recognise this is an effigial slab. And the problem is, of course, um, there's no real clear, easy source of information to get access to this. There's no corpus, no extant corpus, only the Gresham 1968 book that I showed you for North Wales, but nothing for England that records and uh, gives even a provisional sort of date for this type of material. If you go back to at the Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Stone Sculpture, which I'm much more familiar with, set up by Professor Rosemary Cramp, taken forward by Richard Bailey and others, you know, um, you know, we, we have a really valuable resource, but there's nothing equivalent for this. So I, I, knew, I knew it was rare or exceptional, but I didn't know, and certainly for North Wales, nothing like it exists. So um, I started uh, doing some research. So this is the northern, the, the top edge, um, as you can see, uh, damaged but intact. And this is the other well-preserved edge, uh, worn but intact. The left edge, however, has been cut down and cropped down at a later date, perhaps for use in a, in, in a building or so on. And the back shows evidence of some damage and scouring and so on. And the bottom, of course, is knocked off. But it's not just simply knocked off in one shape. It's also got this dish shape, suggesting, again, an architectural reuse and uh, adaption for fitting into some, some sort of post-medieval structure, I suggest, su suspect. So we've lost the context more than once. And this is the close up of the, the head. And you can see the, the tonsure. You can see the, the beginnings of a side block of hair that would have come down to the ears. So this isn't the edge of the head. It would have come down here. Um, you've got the nine curls. One in, um, well, it's probably 10 originally. One there, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, no nine, no, sorry. Um, uh, nine originally all curling the same way except for perhaps these last this last one over here and then you can see the clearly defined nose the eyes heavily worn and it looks like it's been plastered at some other point this white substance across the surface is not the reflection of the light it does seem to have had um, some, some plastering over the top of it um, wonderfully big ears three little strands of hair on the chinny chin chin and this wonderful Smart, a slight smile. Hence, I dubbed him just for the 
purpose of it? The smiling abbot. Because smiling early medieval, um, later medieval stone sculpture, effigy or monuments are not are unknown, but they are rare. Often it's ambiguous or they just got a flat mouth. Often they look a bit somber. So this is definitely someone trying to, trying to uh, articulate a smile on this person. And as well as their robes, you can see the edge of a book and you can also see an arc, which I think has internal arcs, such, um, arcs within it, suggesting it's a, a pattern held up facing, which is a very rare representation. It's not a crozier at all. Um, it's in the wrong place. It should be up here. You see the, the, these lines represent the folds of the, the, the uh, cloth and the letters. So we have ER dot dot, then an H, an O, a W, an E, an L, and then uh, a little sort of apostrophe, meaning an abbreviation. So it would probably been a double L for Howarth. Um, and then down here, three dots, and then A, B, and then a B, and then an A, and you can see a bit of a surviving S. So this is whole Abbas. So we have a very intriguing monument and one that has no immediate parallel. And, and it was one that was found before. And it was actually recorded in Archaeology Cambrensis, the uh, Welsh Journal of the Cambrian Archaeological Association for 1895 and, and, and from Winstay Hall. And the present owners say that they acquired it at an auction in the 1980s from Winstay Hall. So this is the monument that was there in 1895 at Winstay near Chirk. Um, and this is the only previous record record of it. What's also interesting is you'll see down here there are hints of the text as it started here. The clear definition of the letters and um, it claims it was originally from Kaya Gai, which means it could come from Kumira Abbey originally, but I, I, I'm not convinced that about that at all. But it does show the, the clear definition by the artist of uh, the book and the pattern um, and the overall representation, although the blocks of hair that would have come down the sides aren't, aren't reflected at all. Um, but it's been lost to knowledge and lost to archaeology, and this recording is only partial. If I just jump back, you can see here the traces of those letters on this worn side, confirming what that shows. You can see the arc within there, and you can possibly see the slight edge of the book there, although the artist is not accurately recording it in a modern as a modern drawing might. Uh, so you've got a real sense of a monument that um, has been lost for over a century uh, since it was first given a sketch and has received no attention. Indeed, um, that sketch wasn't mentioned by Colin Gresham in his, in his survey of North Wales's late medieval funerary monuments. And so it has really, even though it was published, it escaped attention there. So I realised this was an opportunity to publish this. And with Dave Crane and Gillian Smith of uh, Langlothler Museum and Aaron Watson as artist, we went forward and published it and we tried to explore the context. There are a few other um, ecclesiastical effigies, um, such as this one, um, this abbot from um, um, from uh, um, Rithlan, uh, St Mary's Rithlan, uh, been covered in chalk, so you can pick out some of it. I, I'm not proving of that practice, but you can see a very simple, very end of 13th century, perhaps a um, um, effigial representation of a, an ecclesiastic. But that's perhaps the only one from North Wales. Um, there's a slightly later, probably mid, mid 14th century priest, a semi-effigial monument from Corwen um, and uh, with the comparable writing. And these are the only two parallels. And looking more broadly, I was able to note that this is our smiling abbot here, is that most late 13th and early 14th century brass and stone sculpture representations of priests and ecclesiastics and monastics can be incredibly detailed, especially on the brasses, but they're all a real sombre lot. Apart from this one chap who might have a bit of a smile, um, there's nothing immediately comparable to um, the Smiling Abbot, apart from this ceramic one. Um, um, so we have, and that's from a Cistercian monastery, but uh, most of them look quite depressed in, about their, their lot. Just across the, um, into Wrexham Borough, we have this effigial slab of a male civilian, um, and he might have a bit of a smile, but it's difficult to tell. Um, 
And we also have this 13th century, allegedly 13th century uh, effigy from Kiowis in, in, in Flintshire that again might have a slight smile, though it's so difficult to say. The closest to the site of where we think it's from, though, is this from Valley Crucis Abbey, which looks like it's a, a shielded knight uh, figure, um, but a semi effigial monument. And we think it comes from um, uh, Valley Crucis Abbey, the site of a Cistercian monastery nearby in the Vale of Flangothla, because the inscription says um, Howl Abbas, and we think that's an abbot of the monastery of Valley Crucis, a mon a mo an abbot who uh, saw testing times as he was abbot when Edward I invaded Wales in the 1270s. So it probably originally came from this location, was removed with building stone in the clearance of the abbey in the 1840s. The inscription, commemorative inscription of um, the 14th century above the um, uh, west of the, on the western face front of the church um, may be the closest parallel but we also have funerary monuments from the site including uh, this sarcophagus and in the the, the, the uh, monks dormitory now displayed um, various grey slabs from across um, the monastic site and this is North Wales's largest collection of funerary monuments but while there's references to se secular patrons here there's no other example of a Cistercian abbot being commemorated. So this above the fireplace in the abbot's accommodation you have this wonderful cut down uh, um, um, elaborate cross with a can you see the the dragon gnawing at the the vine here that forms the stem of the the cross and there you see the commemorative text running down obviously cropped off but we don't have any other um, real parallels. Um, so what we were able to prove is that this is a rediscovered uh, effigial slab, unique to North Wales and perhaps unique to Wales, showing not simply the name and commemorative monument of a Cistercian abbot, but the first time we've got a face of a Cistercian abbot uh, from Wales. And the smile um, is distinctive. And while this is a very stylized and simplistic version of a broader tradition of funerary commemoration, what I do see here is a lot of idiosyncrasy, a lot of personality, an attempt to put something, to capture something of that person, their personality, their their faith, their, their piety, in the way this smiling abbot is represented. Now I knew there was one thing I forgot to tell you. Now this is uh, Dr Aaron Watson's Sketchfab site and he's created a 3D annotated model of the smiling abbot so you can Go on to Sketchfab from the link below and you can um, investigate the, the comments made in the published paper in relation to the stone itself. So it tells you about the eyes and the striking presence, the smile, um, the chin, um, um, the neck, the, the, the chaucible and uh, the you know all the other bits of clothing and the pillow on which he's laid his head so check that out for more archaeo death in 3d so publishing this paper in the archaeological journal was a um a, a nice example of my archaeo death blog and reports being transitioning through extra research into an academic peer-reviewed publication. It's also an example of how fragmented, fragmented decontextualized monuments can still sometimes tell us a lot of new information, even if they've long since been disturbed and dislocated from their graves and indeed broken in this case and moved around the landscape with claims that it came from Kargai. But the argument put together by us suggesting this was the funerary monument of a abbot of Valley Crucis Abbey at the very end of the 13th and into the first decades of the 14th century. So we've rehabilitated a otherwise poorly recognised and only briefly published um, monument that has long been hidden from 
site and investigations. And we've now agreed a, a, a long term loan with the owners for Llangollen Museum to display it. So once the lockdown is over, go back to Llangollen Museum and you can see the, the smiling abbot in all his glory, as well as collections from my own excavations at the Pillar of Eliseg and uh, a wonderful display of all the other artefacts and architecture of the um, medieval Cistercian House of Valley Cruces. Archeo Death in Action. For relaxing times, make it Archeo Death time.